evening and welcome Welcome to this, the February 27th edition of Beyond the Headlines. Thank you for joining us, whether you're sitting in your living room looking at GBN television or via any of the social media platforms. We certainly appreciate your attendance. This evening, we're discussing the importance of reparations and effectively the progress we have made. I have a very esteemed regional panel, and I will start from my immediate left and just ask Dobreen, I will start off with you, an introduction. Uh, your name as well as the portfolio you carry. Yes, it's um, Dobri Nomad, Antiguan Barbuda. I chair the Antiguan Barbuda Reparation Support Commission, the government established commission as far back as 2014. And I'm also one of three vice chairs of the CARICOM Reparations Commission. CARICOM Reparations Commission. Um, it consists of the heads of all the national commissions. Okay. Um, and so I, I am one of three vice chairs. The other two, the other two vice chairs, one is responsible for um, research, uh, Professor Vereen Shepard, who is also head of the Center for Reparations Research, set up by the University of the West Indies Ammonia Campus, and Brother Eric Phillip, who is a chairperson of the GAP. Diana Reparations Commission, he is the third vice chair with responsibilities essentially for international affairs. Okay, thank you. Yes. <laughs> Our next esteemed guest in the middle, I know, um, ladies and gentlemen, you would recognize. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Colin, for having us here on the program. Um, Ali Gil, chair of the Greater National Reparations Committee and a member of the CARICOM Reparations Commission. All right, and the third member of this esteemed panel, still within the Windward Islands, uh, well, certainly within the Combined Islands, all three you would notice. <laughs> um, so I would ask Earl to introduce yourself and portfolio. Hi, good evening, viewers, and um, good evening to you. My name is Earl Bousquet. I'm the chair of the St. Lucia National Reparations Committee from its establishment in November. 2013, and therefore I'm also St. Lucia's Commissioner on the CARICOM Reparations Commission. And um, tonight I will do my best to ensure we can uh, give as much solidarity as possible to the reparations movement in Grenada and CARICOM. Okay. Um, gentlemen, it's certainly a pleasure to, to, to have you here. And uh, Dobrina, I would lean on you on your portfolio as vice chair mm -hmm. of the uh, CARICOM Operations Commission. Right. And just signal, tell us why, when was the Caribbean Commission uh, established mm -hmm. um, and what really is its mandate? Yeah. The Commission was established at the Heads of Government meetings in 2013, July of 2013. Um, it, the, the mandate was established by, by heads of government, essentially. Um, the commission reports to a subcommittee of the heads of government of CARICOM, which is really essentially a subcommittee um, on reparations. And five um, heads of government sit on that subcommittee, and that is who we report to, essentially. Uh, that committee is chaired by Honorable Mayor Motley of Barbados. The commission was essentially set up to advise our heads of government essentially on the path to reparations, asking for research essentially on the history of enslavement and the whole um, that 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 whole, whole whole history, asking us to examine things like legal pathways um, to for reparations if, if necessary, if if negotiations essentially are not working, primarily to lead advocacy efforts across the region um, about that history, the history of slavery, and to help our, our, our communities, our various national communities, to understand the concepts of reparations, what well, we're talking about. Let me about. Just, uh, just feed on this a little <laughs> bit. What is the basis for this call for reparations? And, and let me just juxtapose this by saying, um, is 
this a case we have a saying in Grenada, and I don't know if it's the same in Antigua and St. Lucia, um, the sins of the parents would fall on the children. Um, <laughs> so it's a call for reparations, one of the children now having to pay for the sins of the parents. Uh, I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> Something about that doesn't, doesn't sound right. What we're saying essentially is that international law is very, very clear about the treatment of crimes against humanity. And what we have done, clearly, along with other scholars, etc., is to ensure that slavery is defined as a crime against humanity. And a crime against humanity, therefore, requires repair. Um, and this is essentially where we're coming from. And so we talk about an apology and what an apology means as far as humanity are concerned. Um, and, and, and for us, the apology says a couple of things. The apology says, for example, that you are sorry about what you did. One, that's, that's very clear. Two, that you commit not to do it again, which is the, the second aspect of it. And the third aspect of it essentially says that you will try to your best ability to repair the, ban the damage that you have done. So what, 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 what we're talking about is the identification of the crime, on one hand, mm -hmm. and the identification of the damage, on the other hand, and that we are in a position to establish direct con connections between the crime and the damage. Mm -hmm. And the damage is essentially the conditions which the Caribbean exists today. And we can identify direct linkages between that crime established a crime against humanity mm -hmm. and those issues existing in our community now the hurt within education the hurt within health the the hurt within within our, our debt situation etc we can develop that let's let's before we get into yeah. to that I, I just want some assistance in what will be done to change the narrative about reparations and why we need it um, I think you're clear as mm -hmm. a commissioner Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The committee members might be clear, yeah. but we do need a popular movement towards it. Um, and what type of actions you will see? But I think that there is essentially a growing popular movement at this point in time. It's all about advocacy. It's all about education. I mean, we, we are challenged because up and down this region, history is no longer being taught, it seems, in, 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 in our schools. And so we do have a population that does not have any deep understanding of the historical context in which we are operating. And so that is part of our job. Part of our job essentially is advocacy about, the, about well, starting from international examples of reparations. So who have been paid reparations and on the basis of why all other nations except African people, some sort along the way, have received reparations. Um, and so we can define it in, in that sense, in, in, in that broad sense, um, except that we have been very, very specific about what, how we see reparations um, manifest in itself. Uh, we are really talking a social and economic development plan for the region, as opposed to other forms of reparations, I mean, some very, very current. There are a whole set of issues right now in, in North American societies where people are talking about a legacy um, form of reparations, which means that they're talking about individual payments to peoples and families, um, which is not the definitions, it's not the view. So it's that not the 40 acres and a mule? No, no. We are talking about Caribbean development, national development within our country. Let me just bring in Ali here. Uh, just share with us when the Grenier National um, Reparations Committee was formed and what is its principal function? Allow me first to welcome and to thank Comrades Buske and Omad for being present in Grenada this time. And to be here in solidarity with us at the Grenada National Operations Committee. And um, the 
ceremony or event that we had today um, with Laura Trevelyan. These comrades came in basically on their own cost and time to be with us and to share with us. Um, now and GBN, they have done other interviews, radio, television, and so on, and to assist with the work of reparations. You noticed that when both of them spoke about the establishment of the reparations committee, I stayed quiet. We are fairly young. Um, we only set up uh, what we refer to as a, a, a reparations preparatory committee in 2019 or thereabouts to explore how we should go about um, setting up this reparations committee because that was a mandate of CARICOM in 2013, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Agreement by the heads of state, heads of CARICOM. And um, at the time, as Greenland's ambassador to CARICOM, every time we go to CARICOM meetings, they will ask, you know, what's happening? with Grenada and reparations and so on. And then I raised it with the then Foreign Affairs Minister, CARICOM Affairs Minister, and we started to have that conversation. And I myself, being um, passionate about these very issues, I, I decided to um, initiate the <coughs> Preparatory committee. So we met for about a year. Myself, persons like uh, Peter and Twine, Damien Greaves, Dr. Nicole Phillips, um, John Angus Martin, Lincoln Depredin, and so. And we start giving how wide discussions. In those discussions, we had Omad coming in sometimes to speak mm -hmm. of what they were doing in Antigua. Comrade Buske was coming in to speak all the time during COVID. It was virtual meetings. So, I mean, you know, we. Um, they were advising us as to how we go about it. And um, we were basically um, um, established by a cabinet conclusion in March 2021, or thereabouts. So, we're the youngest committee um, within CARICOM, uh, you know, and um, so we have been trying our very best to catch up. Um, with, with the work, <laughs> with the work here in Grenada. So that's basically, it, you know. Um, Earl, in terms of your setup, I know you, you shared you because you are same year. It, it's uh, something yes. like the the Caricom Reparations mm -hmm. Commission 2013. Mm -hmm. um, and what is the mandate of this local committee? Um, the mandate of all the local committees are to implement is to implement uh, the um, implement the call uh, to implement the provisions um, that led to the establishment of the CRC. And what does that mean? It means that um, every government appoints a committee. Um, the, it is expected that every government will fund its committee. That is not the reality, unfortunately, for many committees exist without government support. St. Lucia is one we were established in um, 2013, and this is the third administration from which we have not from sides, both parties, and, and that is an issue that we think at this point in the reparations movement needs to be addressed by heads, hopefully at the next summit and prior to that at the next meeting of the Prime Ministerial Subcommittee on Reparations. Um, I wanted to, yeah, so there is that we have to do. The committee is responsible for undertaking activities at the national level. In our case and many other cases, what you have are two levels of activities. You have um, lectures, local lectures um, that you would do online, on TV, or going to communities. Uh, but in our case, we also um, had a unique initiative in establishing a monthly reparations lecture to schools to CARICOM schools. And um, in the first year, in 2020, during COVID, um, it was mainly followed and attended by OECS um, schools um, from the standpoint that in Jamaica, Trinidad, Guyana, and Barbados, it is more difficult to get a Ministry of Education to take such a decision, whereas in our islands, the Minister of Education would instruct the permanent secretary to instruct the chief education officer to work with us. Speaking of instructions, I'm being instructed. So my instruction is that we need to take a break for Lotto, and we'll be right back to store corporations. <laughs> <laughs> I want your folks to play these tree games.
comes from the NLA. Daily victory cash flow and play with. You will be supporting sports and culture. Nation building and our future. So go out and play, folks. Make it a must. You will see what the National Lottery is doing for us. When you play Big Tree Cash Flow and play with, the NLA will support you all the way. Starting September 30th, Monday to Friday, these three games will be drawn mid-morning, 9.45 a.m., midday, 12.45 p.m., and evenings, 7.45 p.m. The National Lottery Support in sports, culture, and nation building. Sunday money Good evening, viewers and listeners. This is the National Lotteries Authority's Daily Pick 3 Evening Draw. It is Monday, February 27th, 2023. I'm your draw hostess, Leslie Ann Johnson. Supervising the draw is Ms. Giselle Alexander. She's representing PKF Accountants and Business Advisors. Quick reminder, as usual, there are four different bed types in this particular game from which you can choose their call-in line, mix, pair, and backup. It pays to play Daily Pick 3, so let's see if you are a lucky winner. Good luck to you. All right, here we go. So our first number nine, the second number zero, the final number five. All right, just to recap for your benefit, our first number is nine, that's followed by zero, and the final is five. So congratulations, of course, if you are a lucky winner. Congratulations as well to our 49 Daily Pick 3 winners from our midday draw. The total payout was $7,530. The Playway Draw is up next. We'll see you soon. Winning $25,000 and up to six times by scratching just one later ticket. Get your triple cash scratch tickets for a chance to live your best life. Win easy with scratch. For just $3, match any of your numbers to any of the winning numbers and win the prize shown for that number. Reveal a money back symbol and win the prize instantly. Triple cash scratch in stores now. Must be 18 or older to play. Hello once again, this is the National Lotteries Authority's Playway Evening Draw. It is Monday, February 27th, 2023. I'm your draw hostess, Leslie Ann Johnson. With me once again is Ms. Giselle Alexander, who's representing PKF Accountants and Business Advisors. In this game, you can bet from one up to $10, or oh, you can bet in increments on any number or dream symbol of your choice, and being with a chance to win 24 times the amount you bet. So of course, that is $24 for every $1 spent Value your dreams and win your way with Playway. Let's see if you are a lucky winner. Good luck to you. again our playway number is 24 and the dream symbol is strong man so congratulations if you are a lucky winner congratulations as well to our 131 playway winners from our midday draw the total payout was thirteen thousand and eighty dollars stay with us the daily cash for is up next we'll see you soon win more with the nla's daily cash for every day with more plays and bigger prizes to be won it's a four-digit game with all the bet types you already know and much, much more. From 0000 to 9999. Choose your four numbers and place your bet from 11 different bet types. Choose from inline, four different mixes, first three, last three, and four different backup options too. Best of all, it starts at just $1, except for backups, which starts at $2. Win as much as $5,000 with a $1 inline bet and as much as $6,000. $1,200 in a $2 backup bet. Imagine $50,000 for a winning $10 inline bet. There's definitely more to win with the Daily Cash 4. More plays, bigger prizes. Twice per day, Mondays to Saturdays. Must be 18 and over to participate. NLA, making your dreams come true while supporting sports, culture, and nation building. 
Welcome back. This is the National Lotteries Authority's Daily Cash for Evening Draw for today, Monday, February 27th, 2023. I'm your draw hostess, Leslie Ann Johnson. And with me once again is Ms. Giselle Alexander. She's representing PKF Accountants and the Business Advisors. In this game, you can choose any number from zero to nine in any of the 11 bet types offered. The tickets cost as little as $1, except backup, which costs $2. More plays, bigger prizes. Let's play Daily Cash 4. Good luck to you. All right, here we go. Just recap for the benefit of first number is nine, that's followed by one. The next number is nine, and the final is seven. So that's nine, one, nine, and seven. Congratulations if you are a lucky winner. We say congratulations as well to our 12 daily cash four winners from our midday draw. The total payout was seven thousand two hundred dollars. Stay with us, the lotto draw comes up shortly. We're playing for three hundred and thirty four thousand dollars. We'll see you real soon. When you play the games of the National Lotteries Authority, you are supporting sports, culture, and nation building in Grenada, Karikou, and P.T. Macnick. Hi, I am Junior Murray, cricket coach, sports enthusiast, and a former West Indies cricketer. I endorse the games of the NLA 100%. For the past 40 years, the NLA has been funding many sporting activities including competition for schools and clubs, and for athletes to participate in overseas tournaments, such as the Carifta Games and the regional cricket tournaments. Additionally, they made it possible for you, the public, to view local, regional, and international tournaments from the comfort of your homes. For those reasons, I play the game of the NLA. Even if I do not win, I know Grenada always wins. Yes, when you play all the games, the NLA in turn supports sports, culture, and nation-building activities throughout the Tri-Island State. Good evening, viewers and listeners. This is the National Lotteries Authority's Lotto Draw number 3477 for today, Monday, February 27th, 2023. I'm your draw hostess, Leslie Ann Johnson. Supervising the draw is Ms. Giselle Alexander. She is representing PKF accountants and business advisors. We're playing for $334,000 tonight. But of course, before we select our five winning numbers, we will select the free ticket letter. ticket letter is B as in ball. Check to see if it matches that on your ticket. If it does, of course, you can't claim your free ticket at your outlet of purchase. So we'll now select tonight's five winning numbers for $334,000. Good luck to you. All right, here we go. To recap for your benefits, starting with the free ticket letter, that is B as in ball, and the five winning numbers for $334,000 are 3434, 303, 909, 606, and 707. If you are a lucky winner tonight, congratulations to you. Continue supporting the National Lotteries Authority. Have a great night. Grenada, imagine.
scratching. Winning $25,000 and up to six times by scratching just one little ticket. Get your triple cash scratch tickets for a chance to live your best life. Win easy with scratch. For just $3, match any of your numbers to any of the winning numbers and win the prize shown for that number. Reveal a money back symbol and win the prize instantly. Triple cash scratch in stores now. Must be 18 or older to play. Welcome back, viewers, and we're speaking reparations this evening. Um, just before we left off, uh, Comrade Buske, you were talking about the work of the St. Lucia National um, Reparations Committee and the education campaign that you had with schools during COVID. Um, just yes. share some more. Yeah, we had two sets of um, public campaigns. One, which is a, a, a public lecture, where we go to particularly communities that were impacted by slavery. Mm -hmm. And we go to those communities and um, we introduce uh, the uh, topic. And um, one of the things we have come to realize over time is that when you're talking money, you get attention. So um, when we started talking about reparations, like uh, Ali was, say, like Dobrin was saying earlier, um, there's this view that it should be money distributed to families who can certify that the, um, their ancestors were slaves. The CARICOM Reparations Committee is looking at a different uh, way in which we would have whatever we get, it will be um, treated as community mm -hmm. and not for individuals. And it would not be going to governments but we would take measures to ensure that it is not just money being spent. We need schools, we need museums, we need different things that can be done with it. So in the case of the public lectures, what you find is people coming out and asking, when we go get this money? Right. Will I see it in my lifetime? That is always a question about when, when, when. When we go to the schools, totally different. The issue is, we don't know about this. How come we never heard about that? What link can you give us to get that, that, that sort of information? Why isn't it part of our history curriculum? Why is history an endangered species, endangered subject, right? So um, we are, I think we, Grenada is beginning to see some of that as well. The Trapelian issue is talking about money and most of the questions today were about sufficiency, you know, um, rather than anything else. But our objective is to ensure that in the education process we get people to understand it's not like um, we're going to collect our grandfather's back pay on the last Friday of every month at the Treasury, uh, but that whatever we get is going to be treated as community property. And on the, 20, on the 1st of August 2020, the uh, CARICOM Reparations um, Commission and the Prime Ministerial Subcommittee uh, held a press conference in Barbados, uh, chaired by Prime Minister Motley, uh, in which um, it was indicated uh, that they have agreed uh, that irrespective of what and how the reparations comes, it will be dealt with on the basis of the formula advanced by Sir Arthur Lewis in his book, Labor in the West Indies, written in 1939, one year after he took a tour of the Caribbean at 24, first black and youngest um, professor on the university circuit in the UK. And that book, which we would urge viewers to download on Amazon, um, Labor in the West Indies by W. Arthur Lewis, it is a template, an original template for reparations. Well, we, we, we'll get into to that because it's important for us to address this. But Ali, just, uh, let me just ask this. Um, is the reparations movement 
defined by island? And I'm asking this because that always worries me. Um, should it be a singular voice through the, um, the CARICOM Reparations Commission? And when we start having island committees, when we start saying in St. Lucia this, in Antigua that, in Grenada this, um, are we undermining the united voice that one would expect when we call for reparations? That's a very important question and perspective that you have highlighted. Through the CARICOM Reparations Commission, the structure that was set up by heads is that for us to have one voice through the CRC. So that you would observe that even though we have, a, we have what we can refer to as an island-specific case with Laura Trevelyan today, whereby that family had owned slaves and plantations here in Grenada, you would have seen how involved the CRC was in this process. Yes? Mm -hmm. So that I believe one can say comfortably that Sir Hilary Beckles is arguably our foremost mind on that particular issue. And as such, in our engagement with the Travelian family, we thought it important that she had some discussions with Sir Hilary Beckles. Yes? So that you, you have an island-specific case. Now, in Barbados, for instance, the issue of the Drax estate. Mm -hmm. That's an island-specific case. But I believe that it would be ideal for even though Barbados have this island-specific case of the Drax estate and so, that the CRC will be consulted in the whole process. So that, yes, we'll appreciate that there will be a plantation owners. In the case of Grenada too, we had the Bank of England. And our approach with the GNRC, the Grenada National Reparations Committee, is whatever approaches that we're going to make th to the Bank of England, we will do it with the CRC. We believe we are stronger with unity and stronger with more voices and so on. In other words, to, we have the research, the, the, the Reparation Research Center is based in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. We rely on the, the, the Reparation Research Center, which comes with the CRC, for information and specifics and so on and different. Mm -hmm. So that it is extremely important that we do not appear to be an island for ourselves whenever there is a case that that um, has a reason for a particular member state, and um, that I believe the, the, the template that we have established here in Grenada with Laura Travillian, I think, is a good precedent for how we can engage the local reparations committee through the CARICOM Reparations Commission and make sure that we speak with one voice. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Dobrin, I know you want to yeah, um, I think we, 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 we can see reparations payments being made at more than one level. Our concept, I think, when we started, we were clear that we were talking about a government-to-government -government relationship. So it was CARICOM governments uh, representing the various nations of the Caribbean, negotiating with European governments individually. Total vision when we started thinking through this. But we have seen in the process different levels and different relationships emerging. So we're now seeing um, relationships such as the Church of England, which we're, we're talking about organization, now to nations. And we also seen here in Grenada the situation of a family relating essentially to the society, to the Grenadian society. And I think our vision allows all of these three levels to take place. The big one, of course, is going to be the government-to-government -government relationship. So you're saying that the CRC sees reparations being government-to-government. -government. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And what form does reparatory justice take from the standpoint of uh, the CRC? 
well, we have established um, our 10-point plan that defines the way we see it taking place. So we are saying we are talking about a social and economic development plan to address issues such as education, health, we're talking debt relief, we're talking increased use of technology, we're talking about specific programs for indigenous communities. Um, well, the top of the list is this whole question of the apology, and we're talking about a series of heritage and cultural issues around museums, around dealing with trauma, dealing with psychological trauma. So we are saying that we, in our it goes back to where I was, talking about the crime mm -hmm. and the hurt. In our 10-point plan, we have identified the areas that we can define as a hurt directly from the crime. Let me ask yes. you, this, and it's a bit of a challenge. So you're saying that there is a plan. There is. Um, the CRC established quite some time ago that 10-point plan. That's right. So let's go wishful thinking. If Prime Minister of England Mm -hmm. And uh, the Chancellor announces that in 2024's budgetary allocation in the UK, there would be £10 billion allocated to the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Do we know how we will spend that money? Well, first of all, we're not going to accept it. Okay. It's not a payoff. We're not talking about a payoff. We're talking about a decent negotiated settlement. So there's not going to be any acceptance of that. No arbitrary confusion between aid and reparations. Because that decision that you have just described is how we would describe aid. That you're decided through your overseas development, whatever it is, agency, that you are allocating for aid to the Caribbean $10 million. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a decent negotiated settlement that deals with the apology, that deals with the commitment to non repetition, and deals clearly with the efforts to repair the damage we've done. And we have defined the damage in our 10 point plan. That is how those negotiations should go ahead. I mean, we, we, we can't, we, we advise we to our heads of government, and that's the advice we will give them. Whether our heads of government will deal with that advice or jump at the, 20, 20, at the 10 billion pounds is a different story. But in terms of how we see reparations and, and how the, 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 the international community around reparatory justice, how that sees reparations, mm -hmm. that clearly that approach is not the approach that's acceptable. So, let, just, let me just because we do have we do have a, a, a wonderful example of that right now. The Germans, yeah. the Germans uh, with Namibia, yeah. finally admitted that at the turn of the last century they committed genocide against the Hurro people in Namibia. Then maybe it has been challenging them for reparations. Uh, one day out of the clear blue sky, I don't remember the figure, they say, well, here is 10 billion pounds over the next 30 years. And just handed it to Namibia. And Namibia said, no, no, no. Basically, that is not how we are going to deal with this. You haven't apologized to us. You haven't negotiated that figure with us. Um, you're paying us off. And that is not what we're involved in at this point in time. So essentially, in terms of the literature, we speak of five forms of reparation, and compensation yes. is only one. It's only one, And right. you're saying financial compensation yeah. is right. <laughs> and the CRC's thrust will be to have all pillars, inclusive of apology, inclusive of a commitment not to, not to not, yeah, and, yeah, and, and, and the likes. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Because That's right. fundamentally, as, as, as Lovrin painstakingly tried to explain, is that we must never confuse aid or grants with that of reparations. I mean, from independence, we have had U.S. aid, we've had CEDA funding from Canada. We've had uh, EDF, e European uh, BOD. We have, we have EDF, we've had LOMI 1, two, Lomi three, four, five, six. Exactly. These eight packages must not be confused with Dead. reparations, which we are saying that historically, 
you have committed indigenous genocide. You have wiped out the entire populations in the region of the Amerindians people, the First Peoples. More than that, you have treated human beings as cargo, tortured, dehumanized, enslaved them in the so-called New World, exploit, plunder, you reap the profits. That, you build your cities, you build your economies. Slavery and slave trade fueled the Industrial Revolution and so. And on independence, and you know, even after emancipation, you kept the workers in the region. Why do you think we had so much labor unrest in the 1930s? Why do you, you believe persons like Irabas Butler, mm -hmm. so Eric Matthew Gary, and all of the early political leaders, Buster Mendy and so on, has risen to national prominence? It's because they were fighting True. for better working conditions for <coughs> our workers, for, the, for, the, for our laborers. And of course, that led them to, from the struggle for better working conditions and the British put down the heavy hand and the heavy fist and so on, our leaders in the region basically said, well, because you know the, the trade union movement is the beginning of a decolonization movement in the region as well. So that the, the point I'm making is that even after emancipation, right up to independence, talking about 100 years or more, yes, you've had the exploitation of Caribbean workers. And the, the, the extraction of wealth in the region continued long after slaves were emancipated. And that, that, that is something that we, we, we must share with our people and people we have to. So that when we speak of reparative justice, we say for all these years, you, you literally plunder and exploit and uh, our societies, our peoples, you have not compensated us for that. Now, you have to understand as well that let us look at the, in, we can look at the news this morning, you, you would observe that there is a, a boat crisis with, with migrants moving to Italy. And one of the, there was an accident, they lost of lives and so on. For years, these developed countries, it is important for them to give us these grants and aids and what, however else they call it, to ensure, uh, uh, in some sense, ensure that our societies remain stable so that they are not faced with these issues of a refugee crisis, you know. It, it serves their interests, their economic interests, their political interests to ensure that our societies are stable, but just stable, not flourish. Right? And um, this issue that we speak of reparations, we are saying that for the hurt and the damage that you have caused us and our ancestors, you must repair. How much is enough? What, what, what is that quantum that can be satisfactory to us as a Caribbean people? I'm not going to answer that specifically. <laughs> I'll tell you why. Because in doing that, we begin to reduce the whole issue of reparations to a payment. That's at one level. And the second level is the difficulty of really estimating that cost. Um, how do you estimate the cost of pain and suffering and loss of life? So that's virtually a non-starter in terms of putting a figure to it. But I will also um, give you the other side of, 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 of what's happening right now, what's going on right now in our movement. That there are three entities right now looking at the costing. One is complete. Um, the battle group led by um, 
Judge Robinson, Judge Robinson, Jamaican judge and the International Court of Justice, brought together um, a European group, the battle group, that have done a costing and have provided us with a figure based on all the variables we're talking about. Um, labor provided, labor hours provided, they've done some work on loss of life. Um, um, a very complicated process, and they have just completed that two or three weeks ago. And so there's a figure floating around. I, I, I'm resisting quoting it because I, I think it's not a figure that our heads of government have looked at yet, um, and the, the, the process of, of arriving at it is not something that has been sanctioned by our, government, our heads of government either. And so to put another figure out there, you know, there are figures out there, the Americans have been talking about 777 trillion dollars etc years and years ago so that's one group the other group is a private organization led by a Caribbean person by the name Enid Williams in the United States have put together also and brought to us a very complicated model for doing this estimation they're working on that and by the end of March I think their results should be in then there's the third group and the third group is the repair group, which is the group led by Dennis O'Brien. Dennis O'Brien, who is the chairperson of Digicel. Um, and Dennis O'Brien came to the CARICOM Reparations Commission and said, I would like to join this, this, this effort, okay. essentially. Um, and here's what I would like to do. I would like, looking at your 10-point plan, I would like to develop to, to assist in the development of social and economic development plans for each of the countries within the Caribbean Reparations Commission. And it is the sum of that, because of your 10-point plan, it is the sum of those development plans, a costing of those development plans over a period of time, in five-year tranches or, or whatever the figure is, that will determine the demand for reparations. That work is going on right now. Brian's group, the repair group, they have contracted with the University of the West Indies to provide the consultants to develop those social and development plans for all our countries. I don't know, they came to they came to here, they came, visited Grenada, they, visited Grenada. Blast, they yeah. came to Antigua, to St. Lucia, so that work is going on. And so we think that within another month, another two months, um, if there's a cost in on these plans, that we may have a figure, a suggested figure, based on our 10-point plan, which I keep saying is a social and development plan for the region, that we may be able to see a figure. Right? But I think that before we as CRC start throwing those figures around, that the people we advise um, and, must have a say. And, and, that's, and that is fair. So yeah. Earl, I'd want to bring you in here. Yeah. Can we trust regional governments to allocate and invest the reparations compensations? Historically, we can't. And that is why we have concluded uh, that uh, the heads of government have concluded that whatever we get is going to be uh, distributed along the basis of the uh, reparations template which Apple was developed in 1939 and was adopted 81 years after. On, in the year two, two, 2000. So the idea is that this is not going to be going, although the calculation of the sums would be based nationally, and therefore you'd have to come with a total sum for each nation, our approach is that that becomes a lump sum, which goes into a non-governmental permanent body that is going to ensure that the money is, and the whatever else comes, is done according, by the book, according develop, to our plan. Develop on this for me, because are you mm -hmm. were very emphatic in that historically we can't. Mm -hmm. We know that the CRC as well as the national committees are advisories. Mm -hmm. Who will be the implementers? Of? Of, of the reparations, the compensation for reparations, etc. Who will actually do the implementing? Well, 
We have history on our side also. Mm -hmm. We do have a wonderful example of how the Jews have handled their reparations. Um, the whole question is about the establishment on the international protocol of an inter a fund, an international fund to receive those funds. Um, the Jewish example, you know, there's a whole a national committee that's set up to manage that international fund. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a committee about 40-something, 50 people from all levels of that Jewish society. And if the Jewish government wants to get money from that fund, it goes through that committee. Um, so it's not that they want some money to be done, some Palestinians, they just go and jack the money out. It must go through that committee. We have been requesting of our governments the establishment of such a fund. Um, and now that uh, maybe small amounts of, of reparation funds have started flowing our way, we really are looking to our government to establish that fund, which would save some of the bickering, for example, that we saw here in Grenada today, about why is the university going to handle these funds, etc. I mean, when we get that fund set up, those questions will be answered. And we have, we have the technical skills and capabilities of managing on a project type development. Um, listen, the, the central bank and central bankers in every country in this Caribbean, one in Eastern Caribbean, uh, one in Barbados, one in Trinidad. One, one, may, one may also mm -hmm. argue that while per capita, the mm -hmm. Caribbean has more economies than any other place in the world, Possibly. you just shine the light and say, look at the Caribbean economies. So saying that we have the intellectuals Mm -hmm. or the academics mm -hmm. is different from saying we have the implementers that have led us well, to go. The implementers are going to be in country. Mm -hmm. The implementers are going to be those persons who decide what we want for education, basically, in country. And I don't think we have a shortage of those either. Well, what we are really facing are, are, are fiscal problems. We just do not have the yeah. financing and the resources to develop. I don't think we have a shortage at all a vision of what we would like to do, but the reality is that because of the nature of our independence, as um, um, Professor Beckles always makes the point about us going into independence without what was referred to as this golden handshake. We simply exploited from God knows when until independence. And so we have been, our countries have been perpetually in debt. There was one point a time ago, a couple, uh, two or three years ago, before Sankis got some money with, with, with its, its citizen investment program and Guyana found some oil that three of our countries were among the 10 most indebted countries in the world. This is what we're talking about. We're talking about countries here, up and down this region, even including the supposed oil rich Trinidad, et cetera, et cetera. The, the resources are not there to fund our development agenda. And it's not a problem of the, 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 the design of that development agenda. It's just that the resources are not there. And I think that it is time, clearly, and um, piggybacking on some of the things that Earl just said, that our governments understand that the financing, the funding of our development agenda is going to be through reparations. There's no other source for it right now except debt and further debt. But is, is this an, a, a positive outlook when, and I heard Professor Beckles made the point today, that our sustainable development will mm -hmm. come through reparations. Yes. Um, should our children be saying the only way we can anticipate sustainable development in this region is if we get reparations? But, well, if they give me another alternative, then I'll have the discussion. If there's another alternative, after 50, 60 years of independence, if there's another alternative, I'm wide open for the discussion. Mm -hmm. But, but Carl, is it, it is extremely important to, to, to note, and we, we make the point all the time, that we have done well for ourselves. The Caribbean have done well for themselves. I mean, I mean we, not, we, we have developed societies where we live 
respectable lives, so to speak, you know. But as Omar was making the point, we are perpetually in debt. That, that from 1974 to now, for us to construct roads, those schools, hospitals, and so on, you hear the government say they have to get a loan. That's just the reality of it. Now, but back to the issue of implementation, which you spoke of, and, and, the, and the model which Omar spoke about. Now, if you have, like I said to a minister of government, reparation funds is not something to go to a consolidated fund. If you go in a consolidated fund, you're not paying <laughs> salaries and pensions and so on. You, you don't really see the, the money. <laughs> Where would you put the money? The GNRC have a bank account. Yes? So you can't lodge no money with reparations committee. You can't lodge no money with CRC and so on. You have no bank account there. And that's why we are making the point that the heads, not the reparations committee, the heads must establish this fund. And, 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 as, and, and as Omar was making the point, for the big fish, for the, for the government to government bounty, so to speak, for the big fish. Now, in terms of implementing, using the Jewish model, the governments can implement. The government of Grenada will say, well, we need $5 million for education purposes, to put technology in the schools. We're getting the, 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 the iPad or the technology from this company or what have you and so on. We need $5 million. And the, the, the committee and so on goes through the process and they make these bonds available to Grenada. So that we, we're not um, reinventing the wheel with regards to the management of, this, of that fund, basically. And it's interesting now that we're having a discussion on management of funds, what structures is putting in place. Comrade, three years ago we weren't talking about no reparation bodies at all and so well, on. Well, you know, I mean, fellas laugh at me and so on and say, well, where are you getting the reparations? Where are you getting money? Take me share if you want it back. Well, right. <laughs> and we are going to have to talk um, about having monies and how we're going to treat with these monies, but that we will do right after this. <laughs> Mr. James, I'm just here looking at Grenlex's new mobile app. Sounds great. Can I use it to check my bill balance? Absolutely. Let me show you. Enter your account number and Grenlex access number, and that's it. You can now check your balance, track your usage, receive outage alerts, and get updates from Grenlex in real time. You can even use the app to report a power outage or a fault with a pole or street light. Add as many accounts as you want. Track your business account, apartment rentals, and granny's account, all in one convenient place. Thanks, Susan. I'll be telling everyone I know about Grenlex's new app. The Grenlex mobile app. Download for 24-7 access. Do you have muscular pain that no one can find a solution for? Are you tired of taking meds for joints and other pains? Hills and Valley Medicare Center on Grenville Street, St. George is here to help you heal. We will help you map a path to your full recovery. Visit us Monday to Saturday for a consultation with our on-site doctor, physiotherapist, and massage team. You will be glad you did. Our Medicare Center, a proud member of the Hills and Valley group of companies. On the hilltop or in the valley, we are with you wherever life takes you. Hills and Valley Pharmacy. Your health is our business. Sisson's Weather Guard Crew. For every project, there's only one crew. for your commercial and everyday needs. For cooking at home or barbecuing, choose Ruby Gas LPG cylinders. Available in a variety of sizes from 20 to 100 pound cylinders. Ruby Gas LPG, clean, safe, reliable. Are you cooking with Ruby Gas?
Welcome back, viewers. Of course, we're speaking reparations. And let me just zero in on the chair of the Grenada National Reparations Committee, uh, Adi Gill. Today, we witness history. Um, the Trevelyan family came uh, to Grenada. We had over 100 signatories to an apology. Uh, we also saw a number of different levels of contributions taking place, family members making pledges to different causes in Grenada. And uh, Laura Trevelyan herself pledging £100,000 of her pension monies mm -hmm. to Grenada. Where is this money going? To whom is, is, is it going? Um, I, I, I would like the viewers because, you know, we hear £100,000 and <laughs> where do we go to get ours? <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone is listening. You know, just for clarity, uh, what are you them do with that money? <laughs> well, that money is not going to the GNRC. It's not going to the CRC or anything like that. The vision is that we will deposit that money at the University of the West Indies Open Campus Grenada. And when we say you, I like to say Marisho House, so that person, it sinks in. Marisho House, the University of the West Indies Open Campus. And as we spoke earlier, there is no fund in Grenada for reparations. There is no fund in the region yet established and set up for reparations. The, the, the GNRC, the CRC, do not have a bank account, so to speak. So the money will lie at the University of West Indies Open Campus Grenada. What we are going to do from there is that we're going to set up a sort of a trust committee made up, made up of maybe two members of the, the GNRC, representative from the University of West Indies, representatives from the government, and I, I suspect that um, a person of the government more than likely would chair such a committee. And they would have deliberations, of course, and consultations with the different stakeholders with regards to how best we can use these resources. Is there declared intent for the monies? I think the general intent is education. Mm -hmm. And the other question is whether University of the West Indies Open Campus will separate a separate account so that it doesn't necessarily fall into that £100,000 into the consolidated fund of, of the University of the West yeah, Indies yeah, Open yeah, Campus. Very important. Yeah, yeah. They'll set up a, a special account for that purpose. Okay. Does not go into the UE pot. Mm -hmm. We're very wary of putting any reparatory monies in the consolidated fund because it, it goes then into paying salaries of institutions and governments and so on. Because you, you know, at some level, sometimes, the, the, you know, we run these governments almost hand to mouth mm -hmm. at the end of the day, with for revenue to pay all of your bills at the end of the month. So a special fund for that purpose. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we believe it will be safe at the University of West Indies Open Campus. And we in Grenada will decide how best. Now, we've had, you know, um, a lot of suggestions. Um, the library comes up. And when persons speak about um, the, the, the library, I say to persons, we need to have a library, <laughs> right? Because we, not just that we don't have one, but we cannot think of a library in 2023, 20, 24, as what I went to in, mm -hmm. ni in the 1980s, 1990s, and early 2000s. We're talking about a modern library facility with, with virtual books and the kids coming with the well, how, the what with a laptop, okay. with a the, the tablet, and so on. We're talking about HD experience, and so on. We mu whatever library facility that we invest in must be modern. Must be modern, so that one hundred thousand pounds, in my respectful view, cannot deliver a library, modern library to us. And the point about the hundred thousand pounds that is pledged by law is that that is seed money. It is the first tranche. There is a continued conversation with Laura, as she indicated today, to increase that money over time. You know, what does this mean? Because I, I just want to emphasize what was announced today. This is an individual mm -hmm. who's pledging from her pension funds monies to assist and start the repair process for what her ancestors did as part of the slavery um, movement. Yes. What does that say to you as an individual? I mean, just the, the impact of, of, of this gesture. I think at some levels one must salute mm -hmm. the courage of Laura Trevelyan to do what she's doing 
and has just pointed out today, she did not have to do that. But she has felt compelled because of understanding the history, and so she believes that reparation is something that her family must do. And you hear today, and the family is calling on the British government, and very importantly, so now we have another voice. A British voice calling on the British government to make it right. Mm -hmm. And it's our fervent hope that this first step by Laura will ignite a flame for other families, institutions, and governments to come forward to do likewise. Said, and let me, let me just ask, I mean, I just, I know, yeah. Earl, what has this movement in the Caribbean caused um, internationally? So we saw this, and, and, and today's event is a first for the region, where an individual has stepped up yeah. uh, in order to make a contribution. But I'm certain the CRC um, and the committees and this social movement mm -hmm. has had impacts worldwide. I don't know if you Yeah, can certainly. Um, in the past 10 years, let's say we had ripples mm -hmm. um, getting the vibes across beyond the region. Um, in the last three years, we've made significant waves um, on three continents. First of all, in the United States, uh, through the intervention of Sir Hillary and other members of the CARICOM Reparations Commission, meeting with the Congressional Black Caucus and other institutions representing African Americans and black voices, they have consolidated and established what is now called the National African American Reparations Commission. Okay which has also adopted a 10-point plan that is exactly like ours. Okay. So our influence has brought the reparations issue, particularly after George Floyd, to the stage it is now in the United States, where the 50, 50, 50 or 51 states are also each deciding how reparations will work out in the particular state. We're 14 governments, there are 50, 51 states. India has also indicated an interest that while we are talking about reparations for slavery and native genocide, which we tend to forget, mm -hmm. but India, with our support, is also talking about reparations for indentureship. Because it was the same, as Stalin said, okay. it was the same ships brought us. Also, the African Union, as of the 7th of September 2021, when the African Union and CARICOM held their first summit, CARICOM has agreed to adopt September 7th as AU CARICOM Day. And the African Union is now saying, let's talk reparations. But let's, let's, CARICOM. let's bring others into the conversation, because I believe we do have a caller online. So good evening, mm -hmm. caller, and welcome to this conversation. Good evening, sir. And uh, good evening to your esteemed, your esteemed guest. Let me ask this question. This um, money is which this lady is going to um, give to um, to set up, which will, which will set up a fund by by the UE. Um, I thought that money is I'm against that. I thought this money should have been deposited in a fund in England as a start to the English people paying us. And so. Based on, on our arrangement, this money will now be passed back to us. Secondly, who are paying for the various meetings that we are having on, on, on this matter over the years? Who are paying for how it's been funded? Because whilst we're looking for reparation, we are spending a lot of money discussing those things. Are we going to be getting paid for that? No. I'm saying, why, totally, why do we ask for money? Instead of asking for kind developmental or um, developmental matters, for instance, we we have the our roads, we have all type of infrastructure, including our airlines that they can fund and manage for a lifetime. Our naval, for instance, we need a, a sea transport to transport our goods that they will fund for a lifetime as a part of the infrastructure and all other infrastructure which we'll need over a long period of time. We come up with a cost for that, and then they will do it themselves 
he starts giving us the money because I'm skeptical of for various governments based on how they behave. Once we come up with a oh. package, Thank you, thank you, Cola. I believe I believe we we, we got we got it under an interest, of course. Uh, Doreen, I I know you'd want to respond to that. Let me just respond quickly. That the whole concept of reparations. I think I've made the point about three or four times today night. It must revolve our ability to connect the crime with the hurt. So some of the examples that our caller, um, and thanks to the call, ma'am, use. For example, setting up sea transport. We're in no position to connect the crime of enslavement to or see sea transportation as a herd. So what I'm saying, it's, it's not an open sesame to all our developmental needs. Um, we are now struggling to, 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 to connect enslavement and, and, and the forces of enslavement to climate change, which is really a step even beyond our 10-point plan at this point in time, that suggests that it is the proceeds of enslavement that created the industrial revolution, and it is because of that industrial revolution that we are seeing changes in climate. So we are making those connections. Okay. okay. We, we have another caller, right? so let's take, let's take that caller. Um, good evening, caller, and welcome. Yes, good evening, gentlemen. Um, should I say it's a very interesting conversation, but here's one of my concerns which I'd like to throw out and get your views upon. The Caribbean people who, whose ancestors were slaves today have become claimants, if I were to put it lightly, claimants on the people who committed genocidal acts against our ancestors, or the ancestors, uh, sorry, the descendants of those who committed genocidal acts against our people. Who really, this is my principal question, who really are we claiming upon? Is it the British government or the British, in our case, the British monarchy? And the other com question related to this, Mr. Bousquet, the other chap from Guyana, not Guyana, Antigua, you would also know that we, in other words, our Caribbean islands, have never been politically independent. We are still colonies, realms, dominions of the British government. How are you measuring this up when it has to reach to a stage that we have to guarantee that we have uh, assurances that this will not happen again. In other words, how can they be still running our affairs legally as dominion upon us and we're claiming upon them? I trust that my question is understood. Thank you very much, and have a nice evening, gentlemen. Thank, th thank you very much. Earl, you want to jump in here? Yes. Um, first of all, who we are, um, when the CARICOM governments uh, made the call in 2013, it was a call on the European Union. CARICOM wanted to discuss with the European Union the issue of reparations on the basis that Europe was involved in slavery, and not just the UK. And that is an important point to make to answer um, um, the question as to who we are asking um, asking the, the, the reparations for. And secondly, as Dobrin pointed out, it's not an open sesame where, you know, we are looking at everything um, coming out of reparations. The 10-point plan um, outlines the hurt. And we have been able to put forward the applications that we want to put to the pain. Okay. To ease we, the pain. We have another. We have another caller. Let's take that caller. Good evening, caller. Yes. Good evening um, <coughs> to Dow and others on the program. Just on through here. Um, I just want to put a. Um, to add my little bit on the reparations question. Um, because I've been listening and I am yet to hear this mention. Um, I, I agree that reparations must not mean a precise payout of X number of dollars, but how do we address this question 
in the context of the fact that slavery, as we experienced it, the enslavement of African peoples, was not the kind of slavery of antiquity to which um, social science and history refer, but primarily the primitive accumulation of capital. And therefore, how do you address this question of reparations in the context of a world system that has been set up precisely because of slavery? And that, that world system has accumulated wealth and capital, both in material terms as well as a body of science and so on, that puts our societies at a material disadvantage to Western Europe and its offshoots that makes it impossible for us in the context of the current construct of international capitalism um, to, as it were, liberate ourselves. In other words, the struggle of emancipation continues, but in the context of international capitalism. And therefore, given that historical and material experience, how are we to understand what has to happen in the creation of a new international order, um, which we tried before in the immediate aftermath of the colonial, um, the successes of national liberation in the anti-colonial struggle. We in a new phase of international capital, and therefore I'm asking the committee, how are you understanding, because unless you address this question, right, that has its historical roots in the enslavement of our forefathers, the current world system is based inherently on a perpetuating injustice. Mm -hmm. And to me, when we are crafting um, arguments to deal with these people, we have to address a new international economic order. Otherwise, it's a pittance arrangement we are going. And it means to me, we don't fully comprehend the dynamic and sustaining inequalities created by this um, international enslavement of African people. All right, thank you. And thank that's, you that's, that's, that's in brief a question I would I, put. I, 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 I wish I, you on a yeah. different forum where we could brainstorm on these things, but that's the dimension yeah. I wish to bring to the discussion. No Thank I you. I appreciate that. Yeah, certainly, certainly, a comment. Um, the, the call is right on the spot. I mean, we certainly appreciate the views um, that, that he has expressed. Um, there are many of us who see the whole reparation struggle as a challenge to the world order, to the existing world order. Um, the question is, if the challenge can be defined at all our level at this point in time is this our old, it is our ultimate vision but certainly we need to go step by step along the way I agree fully with the caller totally with the caller and this is not this is not new thoughts the 1995 for example reparations commissions established on the continent on the chief Abiola out of Nigeria one one of their calls is essentially a challenge to the world order, that they, they ask for things like additional seats in the Security Council on the United, on, on the, on, on, on the yeah. UN. Um, and so these ideas uh, are certainly not necessarily new ideas, but I think that what we have managed to do uh, from the CRC, of course with the, with the back end at whatever level of government, is that we have begun to crack this. We have begun to crack it. We haven't broken it. Breaking it, we, I think, will lead us to the considerations that the court, that, 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 of okay. the new order. But I think it's important that we say clearly that we are agreeing with that caller okay. in terms of what the vision has to be. We have another caller in line. Good evening, caller, and welcome. Good evening. One of the things that annoy me quite a lot is that if we have to build a full coup, we have to borrow money from the World Bank, which is perpetually keeping us in debt. Thank you very much. Uh, go ahead. Just to add to what Senator Humphrey pointed out, that um, Andrew Brin commented and said, that, to my mind, 
is the quintessential issue that heads must address. And earlier in Senator Humphrey's contribution, he spoke of the generational wealth creation of the enslavers, of, of, of the European countries. Mm -hmm. Generational wealth creation. And then he hinted now at the generational persistent poverty in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. So that, I just wanted to make that point so that persons appreciate that the legacy on one hand of the persons who benefited still there and the disadvantages, the issue of high literacy, poor health care, and so on and so forth of us here in the Caribbean let me, let continues. Me, let me get on to this, but just before I, I get to this, um, one may say that a meaningful compensation, at least to generate the funds to have this earth-shattering move and, and meaningful changes, would require us to engage governments, okay. would require us to engage organizations. Have we done the work to identify organizations that have benefited from slavery? whether they still exist here in the Caribbean or whether they exist in the Caribbean diaspora? And if so, should we go about a name and shame in order to agitate payment? Should we be moving towards boycotting such organizations and withhold monies from them unless and until they own up to the fact that they contributed to the underdevelopment of our region. I am concerned that, and that's noble ideas that you've just shared, but I'm concerned at some levels that we may not have the strength in terms of market forces, for instance, to boycott companies, um, to not trade with such. There, there is good research yeah. That, that points to institutions and organizations that we deal with um, that has benefited. Lloyds, London, Bank of England, um, you, you could name it, you know, banks like Barclays Bank and so on, so all these traditional European banks, their, their, their seed funding and so on really and truly came from the profits of the slave trade and, and slavery and so on. So that is there. But whether or not, I mean, we have name and shame quite a few of them. And um, the argument is that, well, it's not we. It's fellows that live centuries before now that they have no past. So I'm not sure if a name and shame strategy would work. I'm not sure if we have the economic wherewithal to really, if you're strong like the US, that can have an embargo on but Cuba. But is it not, for not six necessarily calling for an embargo, but the question is if no, I, our population is aware of these institutions, we can individually and therefore collectively make some difference. I mean, Earl? Um, I, I wanted to make the point that there is history behind everything, and mm -hmm. history has taught us what the response of the, um, the enslavers and the countries that back them would do. We go way back into 7980, Amadou Mbao, General Secretary General of UNESCO, his efforts to introduce a new international information and economic order supported by Grenada and other countries. Um, he was kicked out. Of, of, the, of, of the position through the United States making him a, a, a you know, a, an unwanted person. Um, Europe has not replied to our request, a nine-year-old request, which is going to become 10 years in November, for a discussion. The European Union hasn't responded. Britain hasn't responded. Nobody has responded. So bearing in mind, sorry. Yeah, we did get some responses, but those responses. Responses were saying why we haven't responded. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the best response that we didn't solicit and we got was um, the Netherlands. 
-hmm. towards the end of last year. 18 December. 18 December coming out and admitting their role in slavery, apologizing, and the Prime Minister saying this is a comma, not a full stop. All right. Um, I, it's almost time for us to start wrapping up. So mm -hmm. while I'll, I'll invite some closing comments, I'll, Ali, I'll start with you, then I'll go to Earl and, and the rain you'll have the last say. But Ali, in your closing comments, I want you to address if there is a distinction between our call for virtue justice for slavery and colonization. Are those two separate abuses? And hence, should we address them differently? You, you know, sometimes there's a distinction or not a difference, Sada, in that they are so intertwined. Because in the beginning, the period of colonialism, part of it, we had the slave trade and slavery. That, the exploitation and the plunder continued after 1838. And I always say 1830, because after 1834, the, the workers still remained on the plantation. So after 1838, until independence, the exploitation continued. So that I believe the approach must be one where we take the we look at the package, rather than trying to make a distinction in terms of time and but activity can, and yeah. Are you linking the hurt with, 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 with the compensation here? Of course, of course, because for one, you know, we, we speak about the free labor. The wages, which Butler and so on was fighting against in 1938, did not move significantly from 1838. So the exploitation continues. And um, generally, um, you would have up to just before, up right up to the Federation. Basically, the same sort of economic systems and so on. And I use Grenada as an example. If we look at the communities of Boucheju, for instance, you see the Boucheju estate, mm -hmm. the nice flat arable lands where nobody lives. And you look at the communities of Happy Hill and Brisan that are constructed generally in the stones, mm -hmm. bordering these plantations where these communities were established to, to provide cheap labor for the plantations. There you see um, a classic example of the legacy of slavery and, and, and slave tocracy, basically. So that in answering your question, I would say that I believe we need to look at the package in terms of, of course, one with, with, with um, you know, emphasize a particular period and so on and so forth. But I don't think really and truly that you may want to make a distinction of the post-1838 period right up to pre-independence. Mm -hmm. Now, in closing, now I, I would say that um, to, the, to the people of Grenada and so, that the Laura Trevelyan initiative um, which occurred today is a step in the right direction, is a first step. In fact, I was one of the persons that said, listen, 100,000 pounds is a drop in the bucket generally. But you're talking about one individual making that contribution. We, is our fervent hope that other families, institutions, and governments and so on will follow suit. That, that, is our, that is our fervent hope. We believe it's a step in the right direction. We continue to struggle, we continue to advocate, we continue um, to seek the support of the CARICOM governments, get what we need, and, and today, you know, um, we, we Prime Minister Mitchell was, was present, and that's, that's extremely important, because when persons think of the reparation, the CRC and so on, we are basically a body established by CARICOM. And um, we need the support of the heads. Uh, we need our heads to be proactive right across the region and to see the, 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 the reparation struggle as a core strategy for our regional development. Right. Earl, as you give your closing comments, I also want you to intertwine whether or not our education system has failed us in our post 
uh, colonial era or post-independence or during this independence period um, as we think of this movement for preparatory justice? Yes, certainly our education system has failed us because it was not designed uh, to, it was designed to keep us um, where we are still. And the worst example of this is, like I said earlier, history has become an endangered subject at the University of the West Indies and in, um, in, in fact, right here in Grenada and in St. Lucia, there are schools where history is just not taught. And um, so, therefore, the, 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 our education system has failed us, and that is why the young people are asking us, how come we never got that information? Where can we get it now? And we're glad to share the links with them. Um, I will end my, where you started on the issue of um, 40 acres on a mule. I wanted to make that point, because back in 1776, when um, the uh, slaves enslaved fought for independence and were promised uh, 40 acres and a mule. Um, sometimes I wonder to what extent there was an intention yeah. to deliver on that, because what a lot of people don't know, 40 acres, you give one man and his wife and a couple of children 40 acres, and a mule, which is an animal that doesn't reproduce. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so the intent of a mule was, uh, you're going to have to do the work when that mule dead. Right. Okay, um, having said that, I think um, the positive aspect of it is that we are the first generation since slavery to see reparations on the horizon. A distant horizon, but we're talking about figures. We've seen delivery. We see the Laura Trevelyan family, and she pointed out that there are families in Jamaica who have said, we wanted to do the same thing, but we didn't know how to start. So that ripple effect, we think, and we hope, is going to, we feel sure, certain is going to spread. Um, it's going to prick some people's consciences. We will not be in a position to tell them how much to give, but the more, the merrier. As Ali said, these are drops, but it takes drops to fill a bucket. Yes. And I'm very, very um, pleased, uh, as is Dori, um, Dobrin and as um, Sir Hillary pointed out, we are very pleased to assist um, in the activity that took place today. And um, we can say, I can tell you, that insofar as St. Lucia is concerned, we have seen things here that we can do, not only the Trevelyan example, but that significant aspect of naming the names of all of those slaves. In that ceremony today, we got the, 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 the museum was able to do that work, and it's called Say My Name. Now, CARICOM has adopted a proposal from the CRC, a renaming project where we would seek to rename our streets, our places, rename our things by removing those names like the Victoria Parks and those names that are associated. In St. Lucia, you had, we had two sets of slavery. We had slavery under France and under Britain. So that while we English, suppose, most of our family names and places are French. And therefore, we also have to seek reparations from France. That is another aspect we have to look at. Grenada and all of those countries from Guyana all the way down to Trinidad who um, had French influence, that is another area we have to look at. But we're glad for Grenada. All right, and I, I think Doreen, um, Earl read my mind, because mm. in your closing comments, I would actually going to ask you, how are we going to engage other European governments um, in this reparations movement? The engagement is going to come from our heads of government, direct government to government. One of the positives that we, we, we have um, happening right now is the repair project that I spoke about, the Digicel project. One aspect of the Digicel project is his employment of two public relation companies in England to do that advocacy work with our assistance, with our direction, our definition of what that advocacy work should be about. 
Um, I would like to comment about that first question that you asked Ali about the whole ideas of slavery and colonialism. One of the important things that we must take into account is that no one has declared colonialism a crime against humanity. And therefore, the demand for reparations for colonialism becomes an entirely different and more difficult question until a declaration of some sort by some UN body or whatever it is is essentially made about it. I think in my closing comments, I don't think we have felt, well, it's, it's a mixture of feelings. I don't think we have been felt as buoyant um, about this struggle as I think we feel today, definitely. Um, the idea of this uh, Trevelyan intervention at this point in time, acting as catalyst for others, is also very, very important. And as a matter of fact, to me, that is the most important aspect of it. The 100,000 pounds really hardly moves me. What moves me is the catalytic effect mm -hmm. that this can have as far as our struggle is concerned. I'd like to also mention, because we haven't discussed that here, but but we also have an apology from the Church of England. Again, a couple of weeks ago. Okay, so within the last three, four months, we have had apologies from a nation, the Netherlands. We have apologies from a major religious organization, the Church of England. And we have had apologies from a family. That's within the last six or seven, the last six weeks, six, six, weeks. six, or six weeks. But the Church of England one is a very important one for me also. What the Church of England has apologized for is its participation and its investments and participation in what is known as the Queen and Bounty, which was a fund essentially set up to provide monies to poor pastors, Church of England pastors, who are living hand to mouth. And so they set up this fund. And for them to make that money to support their pastors, they invested in the South Sea, South sea Company. company. On examination, however, of the Queen and Bounty, it's not the Church of England only who invested in it. We have royalty invested in it. We have all these organizations, you know, the banks and all sorts of other people, prominent families, who invested in it also. And the challenge to them today is going to be, how do you deal with the ethical and moral teachings of your church? And you're not going to say anything about your own investment in this. And so these things, for me, are going to have cascading effects. And those effects are going to reach to the governments that we're trying to get to. Okay. The Trevelyan family today, in their apology, called on the British government. And that is what we want. We want another hundred of them calling on the British government. We can't do it. We don't have no plane and a bomb to go and get them. It is, has to be that kind of advocacy pressure on governments, because governments depend on people to be in power. They, 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 we're not talking about them. People have to vote for them and our impact. And that is where I think the weakest aspect of our work has been. The weakest aspect has been the effort of changing minds in European countries. We don't have the reach. We don't have the resources to do it. But we are thinking that if that repair, um, Dennis O'Brien has committed five million pounds of his personal money. This is not digital money. His personal money, five million pounds. And I will assist you to do that type of work. That is what we're looking for. Dobrin, Omer, Ali Gill, Earl Buski, thank you so very much for educating and edifying us through the discussion on reparations. Ladies and gentlemen, certainly it is always a pleasure having you join us here on Beyond the Headlines. It was a joy and privilege hosting you this on the February 27th edition. And I certainly look forward to joining you next week. But let me just say this. I sit in for Pastor uh, Stephen Sawaram. There is a GoFundMe page appealing for assistance for his medical care in the U.S. We'll find it. Pastor Worm is good people. He deserves our help. 
Good evening, and I join you again in six days, 22 and a half hours. Have a good one. Godspeed.